Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the our second uh, session in a five-part session of practice of uh, a series called Embodied Promises, the theme for our Lenten journey this year. And so throughout the uh, Sundays uh, in Lent, we will actually be having uh, pr prayerful practices both introduced and discussed in their full kind of array. What is it? What's the history? What's the theology? Where does this come from? What practices you can incorporate from the practice presented? And so today is the really the start of this kind of the next four sessions of <laughs> introducing prayerful practices for you as members of the congregation to consider incorporating or at least being in dialogue to see how this prayerful practice can inform your own prayerful practices, um, either in your daily life or occasionally, or you name it. It's a prayer for you to use. And so I'd like to begin today with a passage from scripture that will help guide the first part of our discussion on prayer. It is from the book of Kings, chapter 19. It is right smack dab in the middle of the narratives about Elijah the prophet. And this is the moment in which Elijah is scurrying back um, to the mountain of the Lord, Mount Sinai. And so this is really a, a good text to ground us in what's known as a contemplative tradition of prayer. <laughs> and he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. <clears throat> now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. We see in this passage... And at least contemplatives have seen it. I'm thinking of the Carmelite order in the Roman Catholic Church. Have seen in this story of Elijah the heart of prayer, of prayer in which one hears the voice of God, but more importantly experiences the presence of God. And so I'm, I'm taking us to contemplative prayer to really what's kind of the deep end of prayer. So that we can at least see where we're going to be heading to, which is the Jesus prayer, which is in this level of prayer, what we call contemplative prayer, but in the Orthodox tradition. So let me scale it back now a little bit. Now we know where we're going to be heading to. Here's a simple question. What is prayer? And I will not pose it to you all. What is prayer? Communication with God. Communication with God, others? I don't mean to pick on you, Kirk. So what kind of communication? Individual and also community when we pray together. Individual and communal prayer. Thank you, Kirk. Others, what is prayer? Christine? It's listening as well as so listening and communicating it's like a two-way street you know like if you're having a conversation with a friend others oh so a prayer has a particular but we're asking for a particular function right which is the protection of God. Others, so we were asking something of God. It's a two-way street. Communication. 
Do do prayers have to always be spoken? No. All right, good. <laughs> what are ways in which prayers are not spoken? Are there any particular examples come to mind? Thought. Thought. Sometimes you just don't find the words. Uh, I think particularly if you're grieving or very sad, it's more like just kind of saying, you know, you know, you know what I need, and that there are there are words that you can form. So it's a word. It's like a wordless, wordless acknowledgement. Well, I haven't really thought this through, but it's also sending out silently a radiation of yourself mm -hmm. to make contact with otherness of mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a a zen-like sort of feeling, but, but you know, I mean, I mean, when you really love somebody, you you sort of send out these waves. Mm -hmm. I, so, don't, I, I don't know how to express it. She's got it. Yeah, I think she's got it. Judith? So, um, everything that was already said, petitions, just, just a in all circumstances, in happiness and joy and anguish and pain, uh, just a connection with the divine for both petitioning and receiving. And for me, one of the main things is just getting quiet and focusing to hear what it is that God would share with me. And then Certainly, gratitude and thankfulness being returned. There's a there's a definition in in this wonderful book, the New Westminster Dictionary of Christian Spirituality. It's like twenty years, so it's not technically new. Uh, it has this wonderful way of summarizing all that we've just said in its definition on prayer. Prayer is a gift of God, a soulful conversation, silent contemplation, an expression of wonder and thanksgiving, acknowledgement of finitude, the articulation of desire, sharing in God's Trinitarian life, an art, a raising of one's mind and heart to God, and then I would add, and to others. There's also a paradox in prayer. It's both a privilege and a duty, we do not know how to pray as we ought, and yet we are commanded to pray without ceasing. We are advised to practice prayer regularly, and yet to seek mastery is to miss the point entirely. <laughs> so, to continue our discussion, so prayer then can be thought of, and I think I love this three-part kind of distinction. It's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, Benedict writes, there is three ways of thinking about prayer. Vocal prayer, meditative prayer, contemplative prayer. And so we've been talking about vocal prayer, right? We are asking God for particular things. The community asks for God in particular things. We can use it with prayer books that we have, form of the liturgy. Or extemporaneous prayer, we just sometimes pray, right? God, thank you. And you have your list of petitions, right? Or you're thinking about something very particular in your own family that the prayer books cannot capture, right? So you have these kind of vocal prayers is exactly what it means. There's a set formula in which we have a direct way of communicating with God. And that's usually verbal. Meditative prayer, second category, are is a kind of prayer that we've been talking about, kind of wordless, almost wordless prayer. But it's really about a prayer in which we use thoughts and devices to be able to think about the true, the deep mysteries of God, and then from there generate prayer. And so 
A couple of examples, we can think of the rosary or bead prayers. Those are meditative prayers. If any of us have taken the time to read the scripture and just maybe think about what this passage means and how it applies to my life, that is technically meditative prayer. Or even when we've had the beauty of walking around the, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, <laughs> And we see some gorgeous icons, or we see some wonderful frescoes, and there's the life of Jesus painted, or the life of Mary, or the life of, of the Peter and James and Paul. All of these, right, are meditative tools for us to be able to think about the deeper realities of God, and then from there, generate a connection to God. You, you know, the word that, that's kind of missing is sharing with God. Uh, right. And, and, you know... Well, when you are walking around an art gallery, it doesn't have to be a religious picture. You can mm -hmm. say, oh my gosh, God, look at this. This is this is gorgeous. Yeah. So actually, now to add to that, so here's where the three categories are great. They always fall apart in the third one, which is contemplative prayer. And you're actually getting at that, Beverly. So contemplative prayer can be very elusive to, to discuss because what it is, it's abiding in the presence of God. So being able to have a, that authentic sharing of, with God. So contemplative practices are practices that allow us to abide in the presence of God. That often happens with Ben's preludes. Mm -hmm. You can, and that's something to note. There are times in which pieces of music, right, prayers that we do, even Lexio Divina, right, the whole point of it is there's this meditation that allows for that space for you to abide in God. So it allows for opportunities for contemplation. Um, some of the things that we think about, are we talking about Alexio Divina, you had an excellent point here, Beverly, walking around the art galleries doesn't have to be religious, but if you begin to experience this abiding presence with God, then you're experiencing contemplative prayer. We can also think of centering prayer, if you've heard of centering prayer or you've done that, that is technically a contemplative practice. And then, as we're going to get to, the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is a contemplative practice, uh, which is what today's lesson is about, the breathing prayer slash the Jesus prayer. We, we also want to add uh, gratitude, just quite old gratitude. I love, I love this. Beverly, you're my favorite person right now. So... If you've ever done Lexio Divina, right? Or we have Oratio, which is, you know, Oratio, Meditatio. Sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, that's Luther's way. So you get to the fourth, fourth time around. So first time you hear the passage, you meditate on a word or a phrase. Second time around, a longer phrase. The third time around, how it applies to your life. The fourth time around is when there's a space for contemplation, right? One of the things that's recommended is contemplation. When you have that opportunity to contemplate, the deepest form of contemplation is gratitude in, in Lexio Divina. So that when you finish your contemplation, the natural response is, thank you, God, for what you have given me, this experience of being in God. And so that's kind of where I want to now head us to, and that's the Jesus prayer. Um, as a contemplative form, as a way for all of us here in your own time and in your own place to be able to experience this kind of abiding presence with God. So breathing prayer, sometimes known as the prayer of the heart or the prayer of the mind, and then known as noetic prayer, um, is a prayer that originated in the desert fathers and the desert mothers around the fifth century. So these are Christians who took serious the injunctions for us to uh, sell all of our possessions and give it to the poor, as well as Paul's injunction on pray ceasingly, or pray at every time and every opportunity, uh, basically pray without ceasing. And so these monks decided the best way to be able to live into this prayerful practice was to go out into the desert, into, as we I read to you from the passage of, uh, of Kings today, into spaces where you'll be able to encounter the presence of God. So mountains, Mount Sinai, Mount Carmel, right? The Mount Athos, all of these are famous monastic sites in the East. All of them are out of heart in the desert. 
for, so that monastics and Christians even today can experience this kind of stillness and quietness that only contemplative prayer in these places can afford. This, is, this particular practice has been associated with the Eastern Orthodox Church. It really is a universal practice because it originated before the schism that separated the East from the West. That was in about 1046. And um, again, the Jesus prayer, very simple. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Or Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, the long, short, long form or the short form. It is a way for us to not just simply pray to God, right, but to really live out what Paul told us, pray without ceasing. And his letter is actually his most authentic and his earliest letter, the letter to the Thessalonians. Um, a best way to really see how this prayerful practice looks like in the life of just regular old lay folks, the way of a pilgrim. Excellent little book. It's from the... I think that 18th, 19th century, excellent little novel. I finished it so I can prepare for this class. It really talks about this one pilgrim who sold everything he had after his wife suddenly died uh, because he couldn't continue to live in his house and feel these experiences of grief, but he wanted to reconnect with his faith. So again, he decided to take that injunction seriously, sell all he had, and then go around and pray and go to holy places. But it was at the beginning of his journey that he begins to realize, Paul tells me I have to pray without ceasing. How do I do that? <laughs> like, I'm always walking in and thinking around and I have different ideas. Or I work. Or I have a family. How do we do the unceasing prayer? So this whole book is him discovering that the Jesus prayer is the practice that allows one for every time and every moment to continue to pray continually. And we'll get to it as we talk about how the practice actually works. The focus of the practice, practice like any contemplative practice, is, the, is on the person we speak. The focus is on the person of Jesus. So the, the whole focus of Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, is so that we can not focus on an idea of who Jesus is, meditate on what it means for Jesus to be the Son of God, but for us to address Jesus as, he, as if he is literally in front of me. Um, and so that's what this practice does. It's uniquely Eastern Orthodox. It is, and Callisto Ware is one of my favorite authors. He's an Eastern Orthodox bishop. Former Anglican, became Eastern Orthodox. I like that. <laughs> he wrote this, he's been, he writes excellent books on the theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church. He wrote one book called On the Power of the Name. And it's about this practice. He says, to pray is to stand before God, to enter into an immediate and personal relationship with God. This is what the Jesus prayer allows us to do. And this is technically what all contemplative practices allow us to do, which is a little different than practices that we do when we come to church or when we pray the Lord's Prayer or when we pray for our family members. This is really to nurture your own walk with Jesus, your own opportunities during the day to experience the presence of God that's already here with us, right? Jesus is already here with us, which is sometimes not aware that he's here. So these practices allow us to declutter. If you like Marie Kondo, it's to declutter the mind and to focus on that which is Jesus Christ, that which is always with us, the presence of the Holy so any questions up to this point about that history or, or initial thoughts about what, what I'm talking about in terms of the Jesus prayer? I'm going to get to the theology shortly because it's understanding the theology will help you understand why this practice has its own unique shape. Yes. You mentioned what the program is written in the late or 1800s. Yes. Do we know exactly when the Jesus prayer originated in practice? The earliest mention that we have is there's a there might have there I think it's not a papyrus scroll it's a it's an etching in um, one of these um, monastic communities in Egypt and it seems like there's the writing of Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy on me um, and that's probably about late fifth century around six oh six eleven six fourteen. Uh, 
Bishop John Chrysostom, who's a famous preacher of the early church. Well, he wrote, actually, sorry. Uh, yeah, four, six. Yeah, sorry. So, yes. Uh, 411. I am confusing him with Augustine right now. <laughs> sorry. 411. There might have been a mention of the Jesus prayer as Christism is writing uh, basically to a, a, a lay person who asked him, uh, Bishop, how do I pray? And he might have used some of the phrasing of Jesus, pray, Lord Jesus Christ, your God, and that's all you need. So there's these hints. The earliest known kind of written form um, of this prayer happens in about the 7th century when it's fully written out as Lord Jesus Christ. Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So it's not until the 7th century that we have this fully defined. Terry. I was just saying this is obvious, but it wasn't me. So the reading, why, why do you call it a reading prayer? Is that because we should do the FCC? Why is that how you read it? So, and we'll get to it when it comes to the techniques. So it's called a reading prayer because there's a certain breath technique that is used in the prayer, um, which... When I when I will talk about how the, you all should use the technique. This is to say, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they believe you really shouldn't be doing this prayer without an experienced guide. Because there are techniques like a breathing technique or a heart technique that can be used in prayer that unless you have an experienced guide, you almost you could uh, hyperventilate because it has a there's a particular rhythm to it. So. The prayer, the practice that I'm, I'll be introducing to you of the Jesus prayer, we won't focus on the breathing part. But that to say is the reason why is there's a certain kind of way of breathing, in, inhaling particular phrases of the Jesus prayer and exhaling at certain particular phrases of the prayer. And then when it gets to the heart rhythms, there's a, there's a way in which you time the saying of each word according to the beating of your heart. So... I'm not going to recommend that to you all because even I'm a beginner here. So let's not do that because I don't want any health problems. Uh, it defeats the purpose. Excellent point. That's why it's called, we call it the breathing prayer. Can I interject something? Yes. It's a, in today's world, that's called neurosomatic mindfulness. Yes. Correct. In this, in this they probably didn't know that, but no. there, Callisto Square makes a mention of that in his book. You're right. Any other questions? Yes, Todd. Do you think King Tut did this before he died? I mean, did you think he said this prayer before he died? You know, Todd, uh, it, the, you make it, you raise up an important thing. So when it comes to like the history of this prayer, so we're thinking about, you know, this is way after the time of the pyramids. We're also thinking that this is, we can think about at least four or five centuries after Jesus died. So, he probably didn't, but that's important to know because one wonders who said the Jesus prayer. Like it wasn't as widespread as it is now. So we know that by the time the 14th century happens in in the eastern part of Christendom, that it is widely practiced. It's widely prayed amongst every strata of society. Do you know what your king had died? I actually don't know, and that's something that we can ask someone else, probably outside of the classroom. It was 1922, and he mm -hmm. passed away at 19. All right, thank you, Todd. I think, so going forward, um, no questions. Let me, now let, let me talk a little bit more about the theology, because it's worth saying that the Eastern Orthodox tradition is a completely different tradition altogether. A good example is there is no such thing as uh, original sin in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, it is acceptable in the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, to be universalist. Um, it is the Eastern Orthodox Church has seven sacraments, but they all have a different understanding. Um, there, Mary, the Mother of God, is important, but she's not considered a co-redemptrix or an intercessor as we do in the Western Church. It becomes a lot more pronounced when we think about meditation and contemplation. So it's very common in the Western church, which means we're Lutherans, Catholics, all of us that aren't, that have our tradition somehow going back to Rome or disagreements with the Roman Catholic church. And the Eastern Orthodox church, which is really auto, 
basically localized churches that have asserted that against the position of Rome, that they themselves, as with their bishops and archbishops, can appoint their own leadership to positions of power and privilege. So one of the largest ways for us to think about this difference is, while in the Western tradition, we really like to use images and ideas and concepts, even in our meditation, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, you don't really do that. There isn't, contemplation doesn't, isn't based off of the fact that I can listen to a piece of music and then that will open me up to an experience of God. A lot of what the Eastern Orthodox teaches is what we call hesychism. Hesuchia is the Greek word which means stillness or rest or silence. Hesychism is this idea that when we ex to order in order to experience the presence of God, we must go beyond all concepts, ideas, and even language itself to understand the to be in the presence and to understand the unknowable God. So, in the West, we focus a lot about we can know God because we read the scriptures, we receive the sacraments, we can pray. In the Eastern Orthodox, the first thing they say is God is fundamentally not knowable. We can never know God. All language that attempts to talk about God is incomplete and will be unable to grasp at the very core of who God is. That's sometimes called apophatic theology. So, what does that mean? So, if you believe that God is fundamentally unknowable, then how does God relate to the world? So, in their understanding of the Trinity, right, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in God's self doesn't actually interact with the world. The energies of God, this is a very important word, energia. So, it's God's power in through the person of Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, that is the thing that we're interacting. So when we say, I'm experiencing the presence of God, the Eastern Orthodox would say, you're experiencing the energies of God, <laughs> because we can never come to experience the unknowable God in, its full, in his fullness. So that's why in the Jesus prayer, when we are to pray it, we're not really to think about who is Jesus Christ to me, or even to visualize, I am visualizing the person of Jesus right in front of me as I say, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You're to do none of that. Actually, there's some stories that some of the some of the monks used to do is they would go into a room at the dead of night, pull over their caps, pull over the caps over their eyes and their ears, and then begin the Jesus prayer to be in full dead silence. No vision, no nothing. So that's what we call hesychism. Hesychism, this idea that we can only come to know God when the soul is still. So what's the end goal of all of this? Is union with God. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, salvation isn't God has redeemed you from your sins, you dirty, rotten sinner. You have a debt to pay to society and to God, and Jesus paid it all. In the East... Jesus died so that we become, we can be in union with God. So that the end goal of all of our lives is to be fully immersed in the presence of God. Nothing more, nothing less. There's not an original sin that separates us from God. It's the fact that we are human beings. And so the main thing that Jesus died uh, was to overcome death. Because the death is the main barrier separating human beings from God. And so in order for that, in order for us to be in union with God, death has to be overcome. And so the end goal of Jesus of the Jesus prayer in the Eastern tradition is to experience now what will happen in its fullness later, i.e. experience that union with God, that stillness in the soul now, which you won't experience fully until the resurrection. So that's basically the theology of the, of the Jesus prayer. Questions? We good on theology? A little more. June. So I wrestled with this concept that you've been talking about for many months. Mm -hmm. um, and what I finally came down to that makes sense for me in putting descriptors toward words that we throw out all mm -hmm. the time, like center. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And the lowly worm, you know, concept of sinner, we're not worthy, blah, blah, blah. And then I juxtapose that against, but we're made God's image and we're praised, you know, in in his uh, presence and all that. So what I finally came down to for me was two definitions that helped me reconcile all of this for myself. And one is that God is nothing but pure love. Mm -hmm. So when I think God, I think pure love. That's it, just pure love. And then sinner is being a sinner or having sin is anything that disconnects me from that pure love. Mm -hmm. And so the relationship is always there. Just like in a friendship or marriage, you're always in relationship. But sometimes you do things that cause harm to the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's not God who pulls away from us. It's us who pulls away from God. So that helped me really be okay with, you know, all of these concepts. Thank you. Christine. I I think that's very helpful, and I'm particularly thinking about people today, young people especially, for whom I think this notion of sin is kind of... Mm -hmm. This this notion that there's something broken, that makes more sense to them. I, that's why I'm a little more drawn to the, uh, the the Eastern Orthodox definition of sin, which is exactly that. There is these a spiritual impediments um, that impede us from fully experiencing God's presence, and that what grace is is grace is that that coming of the very presence of God in our life to overcome that very barrier, uh, because God's always present with all of us. I, I get so. Um... <laughs> I don't get excited about it, but I was kind of shake my head and, and grieve for people who say that? that I I get I get I grieve for people who say things like, Well, God really showed up, you know. You, you hear a lot of evangelicals use that terminology. Well, this thing happened and God really showed up. And what I want to say to them is God was always there. It's you who pulled away. Um, and I think that's a dangerous concept that God deigns us worthy or not worthy by whether he's there or not. I think that's a very dangerous concept. I, my, my favorite quote, uh, Augustine, is a few times I like Augustine. Here's one of them, where he goes, in the heights of heaven, you're even there. Even in the depths of hell, you are even there, oh God. Right at the beginning of his confessions. Because uh, I believe that. I mean, it's... a. Uh, I think we have to get beyond the fact, right, that that our faith is about we're being saved from hell. Yeah. It's not about we're being saved from eternal torment and punishment. Um, our faith is about being able to experience the presence of the one who made you, the one who's taking care of you, the one who has given you everything you need in your lives, you who's only you. there with you and who loves you. Being in tune with that presence of love. I think that's really not just the the the, the end all and be all of, of the faith, but really the mission of Jesus, right? Is to be able to bring that love and to be able to undo all kinds of impediments that separates that love that God has for us, the love that should be shown between people of different ethnicities and faiths and all kinds of identities and socioeconomic barriers, right? That's why Jesus came to be able to free us to live. Fully. Um, and so this prayer allows us to be in touch with that presence of God, with Jesus' prayer. Um, okay, so you can, in your, you'll see there in your handout that I have you, there's some scriptural passages uh, in which this prayer was kind of taken from. Um, they're a hodgepodge of basically Luke and Paul. Um, I recommend you read them on your own time and read the fuller context there because I really do want to get to the actual practice. Um, and maybe it's it's good to point out here at the outset, a lot of what we're talking about has a lot of affinity with other world religious traditions, right? We can think of yogi kind of mantras. If any of you have ever read anything by Rumi or you've read anything by Atar or listen to any Kowali music, you can also tell your pastor has an affinity with uh, the Sufis, the Sufis, 
are a mystical Islamic order that taught that the goal of the life of the believer is to be dissolved in the in the presence of the one who is God. And so there's a bit of that kind of affinity there when you when you think about being in the presence of God. And then there are obviously other kind of things like Jesus prayer. One of the fruits of the Jesus prayer is it really does help you breathe better. <laughs> it really does help you calm the spirits and calm the soul, right? So there are breathing practices that are similar to Buddhist breathing practices, right? Um, I was actually, Beverly Palmer gave me a wonderful treatise uh, on breathing. That was uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the Buddha's uh, suttas on breathing. And it was has this wonderful commentary by Thich Nhat Hanh. I recommend it. Um, it's really short. It's really quick. It's the, if you've ever heard this prayer, and, and you would probably help me with this. Breathe, I am breathing in. I breathe and I breathe out. Right? That is itself is a very, very important kind of Buddhist way of thinking about our breath and our connection to breath. Right? Now, the difference is, is the Jesus prayer, it's not like, for example, in Buddhism, where meditation leads us to a point where we are aware of the impermanence of life, where we are aware that ultimately we're, there is nothingness at the heart of reality. It's also not about, with our Sufi friends, that myself, my whole being, who I am, is annihilated in the presence of God. That I can only, that whoever who lives in me is just God and not anybody else. And it's also not about a mantra. This isn't, the Jesus prayer is not a mantra. It's, in a, it's a prayer. You are talking to the person of Jesus. You're having a relationship with the person of Jesus. So keep that in mind, especially as you begin this, this the Jesus prayer isn't for you to have any mantra. You're not going to be dissolved in the nothingness of God. The presence of God is with you because Jesus is there like a good old friend. So, any other questions before we try a practice of the Jesus prayer? Or comments, concerns? All right. <clears throat> so, when you do the Jesus prayer, what you want to we want to do is you want to first first be in a place that is kind of quiet. The exception is we're in, a, we're in a parish at a church, so it can be a little difficult. But you want to go into a place that's pretty quiet. Find a chair, like someone like this. It's kind of, it's it's soft. It's not too firm, but it allows you to have a nice upright back. Um, in, the, in the, basically the Eastern Orthodox monasteries, they actually have a, a chair that has a short back. So you can at least have the lower back supported and you're upright. And you want to at least wear some kind of comforting loose clothes. And so the be, let me show you the outline before we actually do the practice. I, I tried doing this on Wednesday and we went right into the practice, <laughs> which, ha which happened. So you want to usually be in a nice comfortable position, feet on the floor. Um, and you want to be in a kind of kind of relaxed but attentive. Attentive to the presence of God, attentive to whatever is going to happen in the moment. And you want to close your eyes, focus on your breathing just for a little bit. And the Jesus prayer, as you're starting this out, is a prayerful practice that we can begin doing for about five minutes, right? You're just starting this practice out. Don't run before you walk. Five minutes is great. Once a day, that's a perfect way to start and slowly move up to 15 uh, 10, 15 minutes. Beyond that, you really need to have a guide to help you move beyond that because that there are some complicating factors in terms of your breath and your heart rate, as I've told you, that come into play when you go beyond the 10 to 15 minutes. And whenever you're ready, when you're actually in that, after you've kind of centered yourself for a little bit, um, you can start just saying normally, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. You can either say that Verbally, you can either say that in your mind, silently. But the focus here is not to think about each word. The focus is you're addressing a prayer to Jesus. 
It's not our time to think about what other things are coming up. It's not our time to have a wonderful like theological discussion of what does mercy mean for me. It, the focus is just the person of Jesus and you're addressing that prayer to Jesus. May I interject something? Yes. In meditation, in prayer, mm -hmm. oftentimes, though, the cardinal outside the window or the truck coming down the street, mm -hmm. or, oh my gosh, I forgot to turn the oven off, will come through, mm -hmm. and it's just, okay, and let it go, mm -hmm. and then come back. It, you know, so you're not failing at prayer if something like that happens to you. Very and to also add, you don't try to control your thoughts. Just let the thoughts naturally come. Let your mind naturally get distracted and, and slowly wander back because the more you tamper down the thoughts, the you're doing damage to your mind by doing that. So allow the sound to come in, allow the thought to come back, and then just return to the practice by just saying, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. The first time, the first couple of times you do it, it you're going to feel great because you're breathing, your focus, your mind begins to clear. That is always the initial beginner's hump. It will always happen that afterwards it gets more difficult to concentrate. That's when you go more into the practice, not less. And I agree with you that you're not failing. You're talking to Jesus. Feeling good, having your mind cleared, breathing better, those are byproducts of your relationship with Jesus in this prayer. And then after a couple of minutes, after doing this for about a couple of minutes, you want to say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Not slowly, not quickly, deliberatively, as if, like how I'm talking to you now. You want to say it like that. After you're done, give yourself a couple of moments to just slowly get back to reality. Slowly open your eyes. And then go on with the rest of your day. Um, when you feel comfortable with this, mind you, comfortable usually means a couple of weeks. It doesn't mean a couple of days. Then you can start to do it multiple times a day, and then you can start increasing it. So increasing the time that you're doing it. So I think we'll do that. If you don't mind, we'll, I think, uh, Andy, if you can uh, turn off the Zoom thing for now we will do this practice here if you're at home we'll send you a, a worksheet later with the actual prayerful practice thank you